Hi there, my name is Vic V. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in Central London, and most of my work is involved in helping people with uh, surgery for snoring and sleep apnea issues. Although there are loads of different operations uh, for snoring and sleep apnea, approximately about 42 or so that I do, there is uh, two main types of operation for lateral pharyngeal wall collapse. I'm going to try and unpick that for you a little bit, just in case uh, you need to catch up a bit. So obstructive sleep apnea is when you snore, 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 and then your throat blocks up all together and you can't breathe anymore. You go slightly blue, you wake up and you this all happens again. You can only really pick this up on a, um, on a sleep study, which is a machine that sits on your chest and monitors your breathing at night. And it finds out if you have obstructive sleep apnea or not. A lot of people don't even know they have it. And it's often quite hard even to tell if you're watching someone sleep with this problem. So that's obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the next thing I said was lateral pharyngeal wall collapse. So there's lots of different reasons why people may have obstructive sleep apnea. It might be big tonsils or the tongue falling back and blocking your breathing or uh, all sorts of things that could be going on. But the lateral pharyngeal wall is when the airway collapses like this. So you've got your teeth here, the tongue coming down like that. You've got tonsil, tonsil, the dangly thing, the uvula in the middle with the palate above there. And the area behind that, that wall behind it, the posterior pharyngeal wall and the side wall, the lateral pharyngeal wall is just here. So the area behind the dangly thing, behind your tonsils, that wall can collapse like this and block your breathing completely and you can't breathe, which causes sleep apnea. It also interestingly causes very, very loud snoring. So if your snoring is so loud that it's keeping uh, your, um, your away from your partner and waking up everyone in the house, that sort of snoring. Because most people snore like this with the, with the uvula, but you can get snoring where the side walls come together and rub together like this, causing terrible snoring. That's lateral wall uh, collapse. Uh, now you can only really tell this on a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Now that's a, a test I use, and, and many people around the world use, where we lay people down on, an, uh, on a bed give them a touch of sedation through the arm so that they fall asleep, start snoring away in front of us, having sleep apnea in front of us. Then we look with the telescope down the back of their throat and videotape the inside of their throat whilst they are sleeping, whilst they're snoring, whilst they have sleep apnea. So you can see which bits of tissues are vibrating, uh, generating the noise, and which bits of tissue are blocking off your breathing and stopping you from uh, having a good night's rest and giving you sleep apnea. Once we've got that data, we can wake you up and say, look, this is your problem. It's your tonsils or your, your nose is blocked or you know, you're, you've got lingual tonsils or you've got a lateral wall collapse, which is what we're talking about today. Your lateral wall collapses in and blocks your breathing. Now it's very hard to tell if you've got this problem unless you have a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. But there is one sign that you may have this problem. So the way to do this is to look at the back of your throat in that area that I was just describing, the wall, the side wall of your throat behind your tonsils, behind the dangly thing. And if you've got a really bad problem with this lateral wall collapse, you'll see that the skin there looks a bit bunched up, a bit wrinkly, sometimes congested, whatever you want to call it. It looks full in that area. And, it, and, and if you get them to sort of snore like this, you'll see that the side walls collapse in a bit. And what that really is, is that the side walls, because they're um, abnormally being pulled together and, and rubbed together like this, it stretches that tissue in. And when you stretch it repeatedly, it, it sort of pulls past its elastic recoil and then sort of bunches up in the side, even though you're just resting. It doesn't spring back to its normal position. So I call these areas, um, I call them pharyngeal cushions. I don't think anyone else calls them that, but there's no one else that calls them anything. So I just call it pharyngeal cushions. And you can see it on the side of your throat. Now, um, I don't have a picture of this because it's quite hard to see, but if if someone has a good picture, you can email it to me through my, um, uh, through, through my newsletter. Uh, you can see a, um, a way to click onto my newsletter and then you can email me with pictures of your own throat. And if you do have one of these things, I'll show it in another video where you can show pharyngeal cushions, which is very, very likely that you have this lateral pharyngeal wall collapse that's blocking your breathing. And the purpose of this whole video is to tell you about the two main operations that fix lateral pharyngeal wall collapse. There are loads of modifications and, I, and I'll hint on some of them in this, but there's the expansion pharyngoplasty and the barb suture pharyngoplasty. And I'll try and describe both and the pros and cons of each of them. Now, the first operation was by was invented by a chap called Professor Kenny Pang, who 
uh, used to train in America, worked with great people like uh, Tucker Woodson and people like that. And then eventually he's gone back to Singapore and uh, set up the World Asia Sleep Center or something like that. He's a great guy. Uh, and he invented this procedure called an expansion pharyngoplasty. And I'll try and describe it to you. I'll, I'll sit over here, so I might put some pictures up here to so, so explain it as we go along. So if you're looking at someone in the mouth with the, the dangly thing like that, you'll see that there's two two pillars, they're called, around your tonsils. There, It sort of looks like a hammock, a side hammock. There's a, a bit of muscle like this, and behind it, there's another bit of muscle. And in that sort of canoe-shaped sling between these two muscles, the tonsil is embedded into that. Now, um, let's assume that tonsil's out of the way. The, the, the pillar at the back, near the back of your throat, we call that the palato um, pharyngeus. So that means... It's a muscle that runs from the palate down to the back of your throat. Pharyngeus is, is another word for throat. Uh, the one in front, if you're really interested, is palatal glossus. Uh, so palate down to your tongue. Glossus is tongue in, in Latin or something. Um, and it's that back wall that Kenny Pang has said that it was a great it was a good one to start with. You dissect a few muscle strands from that and you, you pull it out. Uh, this is probably better while we have a, um, a diagram here. You, you take it out and then you have this sort of uh, muscle that's connected to the side wall of your throat. And then you tuck that and insert it into a tunnel up into the corner. So if you do it on both sides, you take this bit of muscle and you use that as a, as a way of pulling up the throat up and outward. So it's sort of a bit like a, a facelift, but for the inside of your throat. You pull everything out and you stitch it there. So uh, in a way, you could think of it as the muscle um, working against itself. So instead of the muscle bringing you together like this and blocking your breathing, it pulls itself out instead. Now, I, I don't believe that it continues working forever. I, I think it um, stops becoming functional as a muscle quite early on. But the good news is that with that muscle that's tucked in almost behind the palate, A, the first thing it does is bring your palate forward, so away from the back wall of your throat, because doing that really helps snoring. And also it causes an awful lot of scar tissue in that corner there. And with that scar tissue, um, it causes tightness. And when that muscle is no longer functional, it turns into a tightness, which means that the palate can't just collapse back in again, causing the same problems you know, five years later. The last thing we want is to do an operation, which is often very, very painful, and then say, you're going to be back in five years. We'll do it again then. We want to do a, an operation that lasts long term. So pulling everything out, holding it there, bringing the palate forward for the snoring, tightening and increasing the tension across the palate also helps snoring. But it also stops the side wall of your throat from collapsing in because that muscle is tied, is anchoring it back and it can't physically do that anymore. Now, as you can imagine, firstly, you have to remove the tonsils, which is painful enough as it is. And then you've got a big raw area in the side of your throat. And then you're taking one, taking one of the muscles and rearranging the position of muscles in the back of your throat it is a really painful operation. Now, there are things that you can do to make it less painful. For example, I tend to stitch up the hole where the tonsils used to be just to give the patients a little bit of help. And also it helps direct the scar tissue to open, opens people up a little bit more later on. Admittedly, uh, Professor Kat Pang doesn't do that. Uh, and he just leaves it open, but he says he gets very good results. And I don't think it makes much difference apart from, I think it helps the pain slightly, uh, but there is that risk of, stitching this up and um, and the stitches coming out again later. So th there are pros and cons to that. There is what I call the Argentinian modification, where if you've got really bad lateral wall collapse, including the back wall of your throat, so the side walls are collapsing and the back wall is collapsing in like that, um, there is a technique where you cut round the back of the skin like that, almost meeting in the midline. It causes an even more pain than that, but it causes... Um, scar tissue around the back wall so it sticks all back like that so the, the, the back wall doesn't collapse as well even though the side wall is there. I call it the Argentinian um, modification because there was a guy from Argentina I think in a conference I've forgotten his name if he's watching this please let me know what your name is so I can attribute it this properly to you but it, he's got very good results um, it, it sounds very painful uh, I have done it a few times and it has worked um, but yeah that's to that guy um, well done. Um, now, that is the expansion for Ingoplasty, which is the one we've had for a very long time that Kenny Pang made, I think, you know, well over 10 years ago. 
Now, there is a slightly newer uh, operation called the barb suture pharyngoplasty invented by Professor Vicini, who I went to see last year. Um, and another really good operation. Now, instead of actually cutting uh, op, um, muscles and rearranging them, what he uses is something known as a barbed suture. And he puts the suture, so if this is my palate, he goes in and back out, back and forth like this. So you, what you're doing is you utilizing the firm areas on the side of your throat. You've got your palate here. Again, the diagram will be up here, palate here. And it's pulling everything up using a little bit of tension all along uh, this wire uh, that's pulling everything open. It stops it from shrinking back down again or collapsing down in the middle. Now, that's good because it, you're not leaving lots of red raw areas. You do have a lot of suture material going in and out of your throat, um, which slowly dissolves over about, um, about a year or so. Uh, it's very useful in the sense that it pulls everything out and stops it from collapsing in. But that suture material obviously dissolves with time. And the, what happens is that once that suture is dissolved, it leaves scar tissue where that suture used to be, which again holds it in that position. And you know, obviously a lot of us worried that after a year or two, the effect of that suture material not being there because it's dissolved away would mean that everything collapses in. But talking to the, um, the Italians, the, the chaps in Forley, looking at their uh, data over five or seven years now, They've had very good results. It seems like it keeps that uh, tension up despite the suture completely dissolving away. And I've had the same sort of results. I think it's a really good option. Now, there has been a study that looks at the pros and cons and the success rates and failure rates between the two. And roughly, there is a between a 60 and 75% success rate or reduction in the AHI rate with these operations. So what that means is that your sleep apnea severity reduces by between 60 and 75% after doing this operation, if you have a lateral wall pharyngeal problem. Uh, in terms of some of the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, so I think it's about a 67, 69% reduction in tiredness levels after these operations. So that's really useful as well. If you've got bad sleep apnea, you're 69% less tired afterwards. That, that's, that's an enormous improvement. Uh, from memory, the, um, the results in that study also showed that the uh, it was I think about 20 30 minutes quicker to do a barbed suture uh, platyplasty the, the the suture that goes like this incidentally the reason why it's called barbed is because it's not just a simple uh, straight suture thread through your throat they've got these little spikes coming off like that so you can put it into the tissue but you can't pull it back out again and that means that you don't have to tie a knot at the end which people absolutely hate that knot stays for a lot longer than the the, the suture so it does make it more comfortable for people rather than having knots in their throat for 18 months um uh, sideline sorry uh it also it's also less painful than the uh, kenny pang expansion fringoplasty so there are those benefits and you'd look at these numbers and go Actually, I'm just going to stick to barb suture all the time. But that's not strictly true. There are some cases where I think to myself, actually, I'm going to offer you an expansion fringoplasty because I think that's a better operation for your individual throat. And some people I say, look, although you may want the expansion because you think that's, you know, belt and braces, I think you would do better with, uh, with a barb suture. So there's an awful lot of um, nuance and, and finesse. And, and, you know, like just like the uh, expansion, there are lots of, different modifications and different changes depending on the shape of the throat of uh, you know steeple type throat and all sorts of different types of throat and anatomical weird uh, you know weird abnormalities that means that one uh, operation is slightly better than the other and there are modifications that you use them together you can tie them into other operations like a, an anterior platyplasty as, as um, you know z cut and things like that but i think i'm getting a bit complicated now the two main sort of baseline operations is the expansion and barb suture, and they both work pretty well together. I should just mention again that having a lateral pharyngeal wall and that's the only thing you've got wrong with you is quite rare. Uh, probably less than 10% of people only have, probably less than five actually, 5% of people only have a lateral wall problem. They typically have a tongue problem or a tonsil problem or some other problem as well. So there's no point walking into a doctor's surgery and says, I've just seen something on YouTube. Uh, I think I want a barb suture fringoplasty to fix my snoring. It's very unlikely to work. You need to have a drug-induced sleep endoscopy and see the results in your uh, by yourself and have it 
talk through with your uh, consultant so you can really see what is actually going on in the inside of your throat. Once you've had that, I think you'll find it much easier. Uh, and you you know you you know exactly. Oh, my problem is only lateral pharyngeal wall. Then this sixty nine, um, sort of sixty to seventy five percent improvement in your uh, sleep apnea is likely to be achieved. So. Um, uh, Please don't think that this is the, the operation you need. Go and get it fixed this way. It, it requires a proper workup. And, you know, sleep surgery is not easy. It uh, You can't just think that I'll have this one operation. This is how much you'll improve it by. It doesn't work that way. The hardest bit, like I said at the start, there are 42 different operations for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and that's only in ENT. That's not including, you know, the MaxVac stuff and, you know, bariatrics and things. But there are so many operations, you can't just choose one that sounds the best and do it. It doesn't work that way. What The most important bit and the diff, most difficult part of sleep surgery is working out which operation of those 40-something is the best for this individual person. That is the hardest bit. The rest, you know, these expansions and all that, that's easy. It really is. The reason why people have bad results with sleep surgery is because they don't choose the right operation or they don't know how to diagnose the problem at the back of their throat. And that's why a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, I think, is the most important part of sleep surgery. But without it, you get sort of mediocre results. You know, oh, you know, I get about a 60% improvement. But you, you, yeah, you're not looking for that. You're looking for knowing exactly what the plan is and fixing these people because they're having a bad enough time than, you know, putting you through all this pain and suffering. I'm rambling now. Thank you very much for watching this. Take care. Bye-bye.